be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Words taken from the Gospel of St. Mark for Easter Sunday. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. On Good Friday, our Lord and Savior suffered in every part of his body and soul in order to undo all the sins committed by man for all time and all places. The scriptures, especially in the prophet Isaiah, tell us this, that his appearance was marred beyond human semblance. He was so beat up, no part of his body was missing a wound. The Shroud of Turin supports this by showing him to be wounded in every part of his body, from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Thus, we can think of Job, who is his type. Job, as it says in the scriptures, was wounded from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. That's our Lord on Good Friday. Yet today, on Easter Sunday, all the wounds were healed, save five wounds of the nails and the spear. And these he glorified. He did not close them up. He chose to keep these wounds. Notice that the healing of all the other wounds signifies what the passion is about. In other words, all injustices that committed against the Father are amended, and now man can be healed in every part, in every way. Thus, the scriptures say, by his wounds you have been healed. Now, since our Lord took on all the sinful wounds of man, of all time, then all wounds, no matter what, all faults, all failings, all bad habits and vices can be healed by Christ. The wound of original sin and all its ugliness can be healed and is healed. But why did he keep the five wounds in his hands, his feet, and his side? Now, I like the note here. Maybe you've heard this before, but it's interesting. These very wounds on the body of Christ appear to be the only man-made thing in heaven. The only man-made thing in heaven. Something to think about. This is the kind of things we make wounds. Hmm. Now, God brings good out of evil. So our Lord takes these wounds and turns them into something glorious. Behold, I make all things new, he says in the apocalypse. Thus, we know, we now call them the five glorious wounds of Christ. Now, this is very important because we mark the altar, the altar by which we renew the sacrifice of Christ. We represent it, make it once again present. We make present the sacrifice of Christ through five crosses in a stone on the altar. It's called the altar or the altar stone. And these five crosses are the five wounds of Christ. We also have them on our Easter candle, the five grains of incense. But how does this work? How are we to understand this mystery? We turn to St. Thomas Aquinas, the universal doctor of the church. He gives us some insights here from which we in turn can draw many lessons for our life today. So five reasons for the five wounds of Christ. Here we go. Number one, in the first place, for Christ's own glory, that's why he kept them, for his own glory. Venerable Bede says that he kept his scars not from the inability to heal them, but to wear them as an everlasting trophy of his victory. He is stating, in other words, in the boldest terms, see here, this is the best that the devil and that man can do. And I conquered even turning this evil into a super abundant source of good. Only God can do this, and it is glorious, it is wonderful to ponder. But keep in mind that he keeps them as well, because he will not be known without his cross. 
As the angel said to the women, you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who has been crucified. They always refer to his crucifixion after the resurrection. Christ did not want to be known without his cross. So if you have a picture in your home that is of Christ at any time after the crucifixion, after Good Friday, and it does not have the five wounds of Christ, I would advise you to get rid of it because I'm not so sure that's the same Lord we're talking about. He's always known with his wounds. He's always recognized because of his wounds. He will not be known without his cross. St. Augustine draws an important lesson from this. Perhaps in that kingdom, he says, we shall see on the bodies of the martyrs the traces of the wounds which they bore for Christ's name. Because it will not be a deformity, but a dignity for them. And a certain kind of beauty will shine in them. In the body, though not of the body. Wow. Thank you, St. Augustine. Think of St. Thomas More, St. John Fisher. Will they have their heads in their hands? Sometimes you wonder. They were beheaded. Will those show the burn marks, St. Lawrence, of the gridiron? I'm reminded of St. Lydwin. St. Lydwin was a victim's soul. She was 38 years on her bed of pain, her body decaying around her. She had every disease of the day except leprosy. When she died, when she died, 53 years old, her body turned into a young, healthy, beautiful woman's body. Except three scars. The Duke of Burgundy, Philip, who was fighting Joan of Arc, by the way, with the English, he came to her town and his men were drunk, his soldiers, and a number of them heard about Lydwin. And they went to her room and they mocked her. They said, you're not sick. And her belly was all swollen from her diseases. And they grabbed it with their hands and said, that's fake. And they scratched. It was the most painful thing she endured of all the things she suffered. The malice of men. Those scars were all that was left on her body. They were victory scars. She overcame the malice of men. St. Paul also makes the claim in the letter to the Galatians. Henceforth, let no man trouble me. I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. In other words, the beatings, the buffetings, the stonings he underwent. His body was all bruised up and broken from these things. And he bore those marks. And someday, perhaps, it was literally the stigmata. Thus, we have a lesson then, don't we? Will we have any trophy wounds for Jesus? Will we have a trophy wound for him or more? Number two, St. Thomas. To confirm the hearts of the disciples as to the faith of his resurrection. This is a reason for the wounds to be kept. To confirm the faith in his followers. The wounds show that this is the very body that was crucified. This body. And now it is healed and healthy and glorious. Behold, I make all things new. In other words, he did not start over. Okay, there's that old, worn out, beat up body. I'm going to build a new body completely different that's better. No, he took the old beat up body and he made it new. The wounds of Christ then bring about faith. Our Lord said to St. Thomas, Put in thy finger hither and see my hands, and bring hither thy hand and put it into my side, and be not faithless but believing. So here's a lesson. Maybe we're tempted to think something like this. I should be someone else. I wish I were someone else. I don't like this body. It's all broken down. 
I just can't seem to be holy. I wish I were like that person or I wish I were that person. Maybe you think you're so broken down you can't be fixed. Thus the reason for the five glorious wounds, folks. He will remake that body of yours if you let him. Number three, St. Thomas. The wounds are for our continued intercession, our continued intercession, so that when our Lord pleads for us with the Father, he may always show the manner of death he endured for us. He always is showing the Father his wounds. I have satisfied justice. Now give these people peace. That's what's happening. Now this point is very comforting in times like these when the world seems to be falling apart around us. In describing the devotion to the Holy Face, the Carmelite Sister Mary of St. Peter, this is a mid-19th century Carmelite, she relates how our Lord showed her the sins of blasphemy and profanation of Sunday under the symbol of two pumps with which men guilty of these crimes are drawing the waters of God's wrath on our country and which is in the danger of being submerged. We're the ones ruining the country. All we can produce are wounds. We need someone to help if we're going to heal them. We could certainly add a list of many such sins in our times. Atheism. It seems our country and others are being overwhelmed by natural and man-made disasters. Hurricanes, blizzards, tsunamis, tornadoes are all on the rise. And in, a rise not just in frequency, but in intensity. Clearly, we deserve it for our sins, especially those of the first tablet, those directly against God. But we must not lose hope. In another place, our Lord says to the saintly Carmelite, the divine Savior beckoned me to enter into his sacred heart. He then told me that in his excessive mercy, he had given me this heart as a vase, a vessel, which alone was worthy of being presented to his eternal father to receive the bitter wine of his anger. Justice must be satisfied. Here it has been satisfied. He then showed me that by passing through this holy channel, his wounds, the bitter wine of God's anger would be changed for us into the sweet wine of his mercy. But she explains, Sister Mary of St. Peter, that we must make reparation too. We must join in the effort to satisfy the justice due to God. And we could add, we must know how to approach the Sacred Heart, which properly is done in the Holy Mass. In a way, the coal in the thurible is the Sacred Heart. It's on fire, it's burning hot, and you put the incense on, it goes, whew, and that's our prayers rising to God. In any case, we get in contact through the five wounds with the Sacred Heart in the Holy Mass. And God will intercede for us. God the Son in His human nature will intercede for us even at this late hour. Thus we spoke on Good Friday about Melchizedek, the order of Melchizedek, which is the order of our Lord. And so there He's King of Peace, Melchizedek. He solves the justice problem between us and God. And now He's King of Peace. He can bring peace if we come to Him in the right of bread and wine that the priest of the order of Melchizedek can renew. How good it is to be here and be Catholic. Number four, our Lord uses the wounds to convince those redeemed by his blood how mercifully they've been helped. He is showing us how we were saved through his sorrowful passion. Thus, the scriptures say, by his wounds, we are healed. Now, think about it. Let's go through time a little bit. He tried many things, didn't he, to solve the problem? He flooded the earth in the time of Noah. We heard about that last night. He gave us a circumcision with Abraham. 
They gave us the law, of the old law, through Moses, the ritual sacrifice. They gave us wisdom through Solomon. They gave us kings through David. They gave us prophets. None of them worked overall. They did not solve the problem. He had to come himself. And he had to submit himself to the passion. He is also showing us how we are to overcome this world ourselves and how we are to help others conquer the world. And this is why St. Paul says it is necessary for us to undergo many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Where the head is gone, the body must follow. Are we willing? Are we willing to endure hardships, trials, and tribulations for our salvation and that of others? Or do we seek comforts of this world? Comfort foods, comfort music, comfortable clothes, comfortable life. If this is true, then the wounds will not be a source of comfort for us. For later, for later, they will come on the clouds at the end of time, and they will be a source of pain. And that brings us to the last point of St. Thomas, number five. We know from the apocalypse that the five wounds will be used by our Lord to upbraid the faithless. The apocalypse says this, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, the clouds of saints. And every eye will see him, every eye, and everyone who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. We will be convicted. that We did not use the wounds well. Hence, St. Augustine says this, Christ knew why he kept the scars in his body. For as he showed them to Thomas, who would not believe except he handled and saw them, so will he show his wounds to his enemies, so that he who is the truth may convict them. There it is. Saying, behold, the man whom you crucified, see the wounds you inflicted, recognize the side you pierced since it was opened by you and for you, yet you would not enter. Let's not be counted among that group. Let's voluntarily and zealously take up our crosses now, even even adding little voluntary ones when we can even longing for martyrdom so that we can have some participation in the glorious wounds of Christ and have our own victory scars. You know, who comes to mind is St. Lawrence. He's burning on the gridiron. He's like, look, I want some more scars, okay? Turn me over and burn me on the other side, okay? Keep going. You're not... The saints, as they went along, would say, more, Lord! Because they knew... When they're on the other side, they were going to be saying more. Would that I had done more when I had the chance. When you're on the other side, you're going to say, I wish I had more scars. That's all there is to it. Why do we run away? Why do we balk at such thoughts? All pain and sorrow will be wiped away in that place. It will all be worthwhile and made glorious and it'll be made new. It was only when our Lord was entering into his passion that he sang a hymn with his apostles. It was only after Judas left to betray him that he stated, now is the Son of Man glorified. There is a mystery here, and we're afraid of it. Let's not run from it. Let's embrace it and not use Easter as a time for self-indulgence and excuses but rather as a source of faith, hope, and grace to continue on our path to heavenly glory. Because St. Paul said, so clear in Romans chapter 6, he who dies with Christ, rises with Christ. He who dies with Christ, rises with Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.